welcome once again. I've just celebrated Mass outdoors and I've uh, retired now to the sheep shed for proper lighting for the video. I used the word apostasy a few times during the Mass and seemingly some people have been alerted to the fact that some people hadn't a clue what I was talking about. Well, if you want to know what apostasy means, look at the empty churches of a Sunday morning. That's apostasy. Look at the drop away from the faith. That's apostasy. And the greatest virus going through our country at the present time is the spirit of apostasy. That's a far worse virus than COVID-19. And we pray against COVID-19, we, we should be praying ten times as hard against the spirit of apostasy. And the grace to do everything in our power to come against the spirit of apostasy. The opening reading today, Ezekiel in the Old Testament was looking at the issue of what about a person who lives a good life most of his life and then later on in his life goes off the rails and starts doing bad things. And then on the other hand, a person who has been a rake all his life and then towards the end of his life converts and turns back to God. Which of them is right towards God in the eyes of God? Now, Ezekiel was speaking before the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so there are certain things that are known to us today that would not have been so well known in the time of Ezekiel. And certain graces that are available to us today that would not have been so available in the time of Ezekiel. But basically, if a person's heart is totally right before God, he's not go he or she is not going to go off the rails uh, later on in life. And if a person does go off the rails later on in life, it just proves that his or her heart, unless there's a medical problem, of course, there can be a medical problem that affects the brain or an injury that affects the brain. I'm not talking about that. But apart from that, if a person later on in life goes off the rails, it's a sign the heart was never right with God. Their heart had never been purified, cleansed, transformed by God's grace. Take the case of, say, immortal relationships. There are many people, sadly, who would get involved in immortal relationships if they had the opportunity to do so. And the fact that they don't have the opportunity to do so doesn't mean that it's not in their heart. Jesus spoke about the person who had committed adultery in the heart. And so, too, if, if you're in a situation where you're only walking in God's ways because you don't have the opportunity to do otherwise, then your heart has not been cleansed. There are people who would steal if they had the opportunity. The fact that they don't steal is no credit to them because it's, the, it's in the heart. There are people who would carry out acts of violence if they had the opportunity. And the fact that they're not able to carry out acts of violence or revenge, that is no credit to them because sadly in their hearts, their heart has not been cleansed, their heart has not been purified. I suppose one thing that could be used as an illustration is when, sadly, pornography became widespread and widely available, available to everybody who has the internet. And when that happened, there were some people, of course, naturally repulsed against it, and praise God for that. But of those who were not repulsed against it, you could divide the rest into a sort of four groups. There were those, sadly, who just embraced it, who are hooked on it, who are making no effort to be delivered from it. Then there are those who at first were tempted by it, but realized that it was not of God, and then through the grace of God managed to starve it. And now, praise God, the heart is purified where pornography is concerned. Pornography is there on the computer and they won't go into it because the heart has been purified. And then there are those, of course, who heart was so purified already that they weren't tempted by it and praise God for that. But that's just an illustration of how something could be in a person's heart. And if the opportunity arises, then 
they give way to it. And the reason they give way to it is that their heart has not been transformed by God. I was reflecting on this yesterday and praying about what I might say today. And I just went in on our God's Cottage YouTube channel to just see how last Sunday's homily was going. And I just looked at the latest comments. And by coincidence, well, I don't believe it was a coincidence, a person called Richard Fagan yesterday had put in a comment. And his comment was, here's seven words that Satan hates and fears. And they are, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. When we enter through the narrow gates that leads to life in the confession box. Now, I hadn't actually planned to speak on confession today. I'd been planning to give a full talk on it later on, but I hadn't been planning to touch on it today. But as I read those words, I felt convinced that God was wanting me to touch on it today. I felt convinced those words just spoke to me. And I felt that, yes, there's a message there for somebody. A message there perhaps for somebody here today. A message perhaps for some people who will be watching this on the internet. Now, I'm aware at the present time that for some people getting to the sacrament of confession, getting to the sacrament of confession is not so easy. That confessions are not that available, unfortunately, due to the circumstances of our time, and we have to understand that. Though I also believe, as you can see here, the challenge for all of us is to find ways during this crisis of creating a place and a surrounding where people can worship God and also to create a place and a surrounding where one can have confessions held in a safe manner. And that's what I'll be trying to do later on after the uh, ceremonies conclude today, be available for confessions in a safe manner. That's important. That is important, that we take proper precautions to protect ourselves, to protect the priest, to protect everybody from the coronavirus uh, when we are going to confession. Some years ago, I brought out a book on confession, Confession, a journey into healing, self-discovery, and God's plan. And in that booklet, I refer to the fact of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I quoted those 12 steps. Step four, made a searching and fearless mortal inventory of ourselves. Step five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And then another step to make direct amends wherever possible for any hurt that we have caused. Now, where those steps are taken properly, when they're taken properly in the AA program, broken down alcoholics, who sometimes are broken, broken not just emotionally, not just mentally, but even physically, as well as having the addiction to the drink. They are able to be delivered from their drink addiction, and they are able to come into enormous healing. One can see remarkable results where those steps are taken sincerely. And yet, is it not a perfect blueprint for the sacrament of confession. And my question is, why is it that those steps, where there isn't the grace of the sacrament, have the power to transform a person's life? And yet, in the sacrament of confession, where we have the grace of the sacrament, so often very little progress is seen. Now, I would suggest that there are a number of reasons for that. The first one I point to is, in fact, the confession box. I would suggest that if they put confession boxes into the AA room and started doing the 12 steps to the confession box, I think there'd be a drastic drop in the, the a number of transformations. 
when we're confessing anonymously, it's effectively anonymously in the confession box, we're not really making an honest confession to another human being. It's anonymous. It's not directly to another human being. And that's one of the problems. That's why, when possible, I hold confessions outside the confession box. A second reason is that in the AA program, they have a person who is known as the sponsor. And they go back to that sponsor each time to see how they're getting on on the 12 steps. With the sacrament of confession, we tend to go to this priest, that priest, the other priest. Often it's not possible to have a regular confessor. If it's possible for you to have a regular confessor, then I encourage you to do so. If it's possible for you to go to the same priest again and again to confession, then do so. And the reason I say that is, if you know that you're going to back to Father Pat or Father Jim to confession, and a temptation comes to you during the month, you'll also realize, oh, this is something I'll have to uh, tell Father Jim or Father Pat. But also, it creates a sort of a continuation that the blessing or grace of the sacrament of confession in some mysterious way continues during the month. At the moment, due to various factors, I haven't a regular confessor. I did have up until recently. I will soon have again, please God. But when Father Jim was my regular confessor, sometimes if something cropped up during the month, and I said to myself, oh, that's something I must tell Father Jim the next time I go to confession, immediately I experienced a sense of healing in that area of my being, so much so that when it came to confession the next time, I felt no need to confess it. The Lord had already dealt with it. Again, another reason why I would suggest that the sacrament of confession, we often don't see the results we should see from it, is in the AA program, it stresses the exact nature of one's wrongs one is to share. But some people, when they come to confession, if they have something juicy to tell, They'll tell it in such a way that hopefully God will get some sort of a clue about what they're talking about, but that the priest won't. That's a fact. And sadly, that sort of confessing is not opening up the issues to the light of Christ. The one thing when I was chosen a confessor before, the one thing the Lord impressed on me was that it not be some special famous priest or anything like that, just a good holy priest. But that the one thing was that I would be able to be totally honest with him and would hold nothing back. And the Lord impressed on me that it wouldn't be anything he'd say to me. But the fact that my being totally honest with him would be, would be what would open my inner self to the light of Christ. And so that is what I recommend. But, but going back to the sacrament confession, I would encourage you, when preparing for the sacrament confession, not to prepare a big long list of sins. I would encourage you to focus on the one or two or three things that are really live issues for you at that particular moment. Where is it that you need healing? Where is it you need transformation? Hold one or two or three things before the Lord. Indeed, sometimes when a person comes in to me and they list out quite a big long range of things, after they list it out, I ask them, well, what is the number one issue? that you need to bring before the Lord in confession today. And normally they're able to identify it. Because I believe that it's not possible to bring a dozen things before the Lord at one time. It's okay from the Lord's side, but not from our side. To become open to the healing light of Christ, I recommend the bringing of just one, two, or three, and Try to become as much aware of them as you can. How did they enter your life? What way are they affecting you? What way do you need deliverance from, uh, from them? And then come to the Lord in confession, praying for that grace to be delivered 
And indeed, if over a period of time that there's something serious you're confessing again and again, I'm talking now about something serious, not about some trivial matter. If there's something serious you're confessing again and again, ask yourself, well, why am I not coming into deliverance? The sacrament of confession is above all meant to be a healing sacrament. If you're not making progress, ask the Holy Spirit to show you why you're not making progress. But again, conscious that some people at the present time may have difficulty going to confession, getting confession because of the present situation. If you have a real felt need to go to confession, I would encourage you, phone your priest up and ask him, would it be possible for her to go to confession? I Again, of course, I encourage creating a safe space for confession, where possible outdoors, where possible wear the masks. And some people are against the masks, and maybe I'll talk about that another day. But where possible, wear the masks, create a safe space, and go to confession. Some people may not need to go urgently to confession, and if you don't need to go urgently, if there isn't a felt need, then bear with this time, suffer this time, offer it up to God. Now, in today's gospel, Jesus spoke, he challenged the Pharisees, and the religious leaders of the time, and he said to them, look, prostitutes and tax collectors are going into the kingdom of God, and you are not. Now, don't interpret that as some people have, that prostitutes and tax collectors, whatever they represent nowadays, that they are going to go straight into the kingdom of God without repenting. They're not. They are not. What Jesus was talking about was where people were repenting of their sins and opening their hearts to God. And the religious leaders of their time, they didn't realize they needed to repent of their sins. They didn't realize they needed to open their hearts to God. And that was their problem. Blessed are those who realize their need to confess their sins. Blessed are those who realize their need for God. And your sin can become a blessing for you. Become aware of your sinfulness. Open that part of your being to God. If you do, then your past sins can actually become a blessing. Your sins have a potential to either be a blessing for you or a curse for you. They're a blessing for you if you receive the grace to surrender them to God, to accept God's forgiveness, to repent of them. They will become a curse upon you if you do not repent of them. And make no mistake about that, the number one way we come under a curse is through our own sinfulness. But God's desire is to bring healing into our lives. That is God's number one desire, to bring healing and deliverance into our lives. So I encourage you to come to the Lord with total trust, with total trust in his mercy. No fear. Do not fear God when you're coming in repentance. You have no need to fear God if you have repentance in your heart. Come to the throne of grace with confidence, with the knowledge that, it, as Jesus said, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who feel to have no need of, of repenting. So let's create joy in heaven. Let's come to the Lord with confidence. With sincere repentance of our sin. And I invite you now to hold before the Lord whatever is your number one area of difficulty. Your number one. And I pray now that God's blessing may rise up within you. I pray for, for you the grace to so love God that you will be able to starve this inclination. 
and that the grace, that the power of God will enter into you, and that the power of God will bring you healing and deliverance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your attention. And immediately now, there will be the blessing with the Blessed Sacrament. I'll explain it when I expose the Blessed Sacrament. And then after that, should anybody wish to go to confession, I'll be available. Thank you. And each Sunday at the moment, we're having afternoons of prayer.